And the title of our sermon this morning <clears throat> is The Love of Christ. The Love of Christ. And we are in John chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. The end of John chapter 13, as we are in the upper room with the disciples. Most professing Christians today willfully hold to a concept of God's love that is completely divorced from anything they find inconvenient or uncomfortable about it. They strip from the biblical understanding of God's love anything that this world would define as unloving. So condemnation is out the window, right? Hell, wrath, intolerance for sin, demands for obedience, pesky commandments, right? Chastening, authority, absolute truth, the exclusivity of Christ, the blood of the cross. By their own doing and in their own ignorance, the love of God is first isolated from and then rendered incompatible with the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God, the justice of God, the judgment of God, the wisdom of God, the wrath of God, the will of God, and the word of God. So having focused on one attribute of God that they can tolerate, they focus on that one attribute they can tolerate if they can define it for themselves. And so they jettison from the love of God, they jettison the holiness of God. They jettison the justice of God and the sovereignty of God and the immutability of God, the aseity of God. And what remains, what's left over, is a worldly, unbiblical, perverted, corrupted, shallow, self-indulgent, man-centered, man-pleasing, man-defined, vomit-producing aberration that they call in the world the love of God. Now, this wicked, counterfeit Christianity then declares victory, right? Love wins, what they say. They proclaim it in their so-called churches, preach it from their so-called pulpits, write it in their books, they splash it all over social media, and they claim that love of God, that aberration, they claim it while they wallow in their sin. And they believe a great victory has been won. Great victory has been won. Now, why? Because in their view of the love of God, they have dethroned God. I was in a conversation this last week with a pastor from the UMC, the United Methodist Church, which is an apostate organization. And she was telling me that she can be a pastor despite what God's word says because, and I quote, God is great enough and big enough to create and to love and to welcome people of even vastly different understandings of what it means to follow Jesus. Now, in other words, in other words, God is narrow-minded and small if he limits himself to love according to his word. Now, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemous. It's not about being right or wrong, she said, but about doing your best to love and serve God the best way we know how. Now, maybe that means loving and serving God as an adulterer, or loving and serving God as a sodomite, a liar, or a drunkard, or a Bible denying female, so called pastor, right? It's okay. It's okay. It's not about being right or wrong, it's about doing your best. The world's perversion or corruption of God's love, his love becomes so unconditional that once you've turned to Christ, it really doesn't matter how you live your life. The only condition is that you do your best. Now, if you listen to that, if you think about that, there's an element of truth to that statement, isn't there? There's an element of truth there. But do you see how cunning and deceitful the enemy is? They use that statement, just do your best as a license for sin and rebellion. While the Christian is saying in his heart, right, the Holy Spirit of God indwelling him, I want to do my best. I want to live for Christ. I want to please him. 
But the Christian means it. He means it in faith, by the power of his spirit, according to the word of God. And he knows that at the end of the day, when he has done all those things which he has commanded, he can only say, I am an unprofitable servant. I've only done what was my duty to do. A corrupt understanding of God's love leads to a perverted and blasphemous view of God. When you twist God's love in the way that so many do, God is not on the throne any longer. You're on the throne. Man is on the throne. Because he's great enough and big enough to love people who can define sin and define his word and define his love for themselves. The truth is, God is always on his throne. God is enthroned. And there's nothing that you can do about that. And one day, those that portray him in this way will be held to account for their attempted mutiny. God has revealed himself in his word to be the one who lavishes, lavishes a matchless, incomparable, ineffable love in Christ on undeserving sinners. He is the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and what? And keep his commandments. That's right. The love of God. The love of God defined in his word, defined by God, as revealed by him to us. The love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord is a glorious love. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end, ace telos, to the limit. And I want us to mature in our understanding of that love through our text this morning. Look with me at John chapter 13 and look beginning at verse 31. In this text, there are three primary ways in which the true and biblical love of Christ is seen expressed in this passage. We see his love expressed at the cross, through the commandment, and in the covenant. At the cross, through the commandment, and in the covenant. The love of Christ is expressed first at the cross in verses 31 through 32. Secondly, through the commandment in verses 33 through 35. And third, in the covenant, verses 36 through 38. Let's begin as we should by looking at the love of Christ expressed at the cross, beginning in verse 31. Verse 31 says this. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Now as verse 31 begins... Judas the betrayer has left the upper room and has gone out into the night on his detestable mission to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas is that kind of guy that can brighten a room just by leaving it, right? Now the disciples are just with themselves, with the Lord. The divisive traitor leaves the room and now it's just pure loving fellowship with his own, the Lord and his his true disciples, right? Judas has never been born again. His heart is hard. He's devoid of the things of God. He's the son of Adam, the son of perdition, and so he's predisposed to satanic influence. And if you look at chapter 13, verse 2, Satan has already put it into the heart of Judas to betray the Lord. And then in chapter 13, verse 27, Satan takes him. His hypocrisy in taking the bread from the hand of Jesus was the final straw that seals his fate. The Lord sending him out now sets in motion a chain of events that will culminate in the crucifixion of the only begotten Son of God. In verse 27, Jesus said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. So now in verse 31, when Judas had gone out, the Lord now has the inevitability of the cross on his mind when he turns to those whom he loves and he says, now the Son of Man is glorified. Looking at this, he he sees the whole chain of events with certainty, with a certainty of a completed reality. It's like it's done. The Son of Man is glorified. For you Greek guys, it's an aorist passive. Now think with me for a moment. Jesus is thinking of the cross And he's thinking about all that the cross entails as he speaks about his glory to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greek foolishness, to this world, shameful, but to God the Father and to God the Son, the cross is his glory. Do you see? Why is that? Why is that? One, because the cross is the ultimate expression 
of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at some ways in which that's the case. One place in Scripture among many that teaches this same truth is in Romans 3. And I want you to go there with me. Romans chapter 3. And let's look at this ultimate expression of the love of Christ and why that glorifies the Son and glorifies the Father. Romans chapter 3. And think with me now as we go through this text. Look beginning at verse 9. In verse 9, Paul gives the devastating verdict, right? All of us, both Jews and Greeks, all of us are under sin. Look at verse 10. There is none righteous. No, not one. I thought I was a good person. No, you're not. There's none right. There's none? There's none righteous. There are no good people. There are none righteous. No, not one. There's none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now, God is perfectly righteous. God is perfectly good, perfectly holy. And God created us, his creation, to bear that image, to be holy as he is holy. However, all of us, you and I both, all of us in sin, we have all turned aside in our rebellion against God, and we have become unprofitable. God is righteous, and we are all, every one of us, unrighteous. The truth of Scripture is there's absolutely nothing that you or I can do to make ourselves righteous. God expects us, demands us to be righteous, and no one will be declared righteous in God's sight here by keeping the law or doing good. There's nothing that we can do. It completely eradicates any notion of human performance or human achievement here. Now drop down to verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that's all of us, we were born as a son of Adam or a daughter of Adam, we're born under the law, and whatever the law says, it says to all of us who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You have a sense this morning, outside of Christ, of your guilt before God. Have you come to the point where you have acknowledged your great guilt before the God who made you? How you have offended him with your sin? Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, that's the condition that all are in. Guilty, unprofitable, sentenced to death. Now, one reason that the cross is the ultimate expression of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ is because these are those whom the Lord chooses to love. Think about that with me for a moment. The cross is the ultimate expression of the love of Christ because it displays his sacrificial and suffering love for undeserving and ungodly rebels, undeserving, ungodly enemies. And in great grace and great mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, right? He makes provision for our need. We have no righteousness, and so God makes provision in his grace, in his mercy, in Christ, to provide for it. Look at verse 21. But now, as a result of the cross, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. There's no way to earn it in the law. The righteousness of God must be revealed outside of the law, and that's witnessed by the law and the prophets, witnessed in the Old Testament. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. As we look at the salvation that God has provided, and all of that coming through the cross, think with me for a moment. The cross, then, is a vindication of the righteousness of God. God doesn't just set aside 
his righteousness in order to save sinners. His righteousness is vindicated, and his righteousness is vindicated at the cross of Christ. The cross is a display of the grace and mercy of God who provides this great salvation for undeserving sinners like you and I. The cross magnifies the sufficiency of the work of Christ alone through faith. It's the work of Christ alone that is able to save. Look at verse 25. Whom, that's this Christ, God set forth as a propitiation. Now think about what that is. A propitiation is a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. And the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied. He propitiated the wrath of God, it says in verse 25, by his blood. And what does that mean? That means that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ vindicates the perfect justice of God. Even when his only begotten son bore the guilt of our sin, God did not withhold the righteous sentence of death, but he poured it out on his own son. So the cross vindicates the righteousness of God, vindicates the justice of God, vindicates the grace of God, magnifies the sufficiency and work of Christ. The cross displays God's absolute commitment to his own holiness. If you think about the cross and what Christ endured there and what God did to Christ there, the cross displays God's uncompromising and absolute commitment to his own holiness. The cross displays, and that propitiation, verse 25, displays the great cost through which God made provision for our salvation, his only begotten son. The cross magnifies the work of Christ in fully satisfying the wrath of God against sin, that Christ could do that. It magnifies the work of Christ. The cross glorifies Christ in his willingness to lay down his life and bear that wrath for guilty sinners. The cross glorifies the Father in the Lord's perfect obedience, even to the point of death, even this death of the cross. And all of this is applied at the end of verse 25, it says, through faith. In order to demonstrate his righteousness, because his forbearance, in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Think about the timing of the cross. The timing of the cross magnifies both the patience and the mercy of God. Think about those saints in the Old Testament. Think about David. Why didn't David face eternal hell immediately for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah? Why didn't Moses go down alive into the pit when he struck the rock? They faced temporal consequences for sin, like we do, but they didn't face eternal damnation. Is that because God's not just and he just swept their sin under the rug? Is it because God's not concerned with his own righteousness? No, but because God is patient. God is patient. His timing is perfect, imputing all of their sin to his son who would die in their place, the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. Look at verse 26. Again, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The cross is the only means by which God has determined to be both just and merciful. The cross is the way that God can be just and uphold his justice and at the same time be merciful. So the cross is the means by which God vindicates his character right, while still redeeming ungodly sinners in love. The cross is the means by which the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills all of the promises of God to redeem and restore his people, all of the promises of God in the, in the gospel. And so it vindicates the faithfulness of God. Think about it as the Lord Jesus Christ goes obediently to the cross to die on that tree, suffering the curse, suffering the wrath of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his obedience, facilitates, if you will, is the means by which all of the promises of God are fulfilled. They are yes and amen in him. It's because of his work, his sufficient and complete finished work on the cross. 
It vindicates the faithfulness of God. Eve believed that a savior would come through her seed. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, right? Abraham believed God would provide a son, would provide innumerable heirs, spiritual seed, who would be blessed. David believed a king from his line would rule and reign for all these promises of God, right? And all of these promises fulfilled in Christ's obedience, Christ's work at the cross. Now put that all together, just from looking at one text among many, right, in Romans chapter 3. All of this is accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ in love for the Father at the cross. And in this, the Lord Jesus Christ glorifies God the Father. He glorifies him. If you think about the cross, the cross isn't only the ultimate expression of the love of Christ for those he came to save, it's also the ultimate expression of the love of Christ for the Father, for God the Father. In his perfect obedience to the extent of the cross, to the point of death, even the death of the cross, Jesus beautifully and sacrificially and lovingly upholds the perfections and the character of God the Father. So, love wins, Yes, but Christ wins, God wins, and then they're glorified in him. Glory wins. Back in John chapter 13. Verse 31. So when he had gone out, when Judas had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. The ultimate expression of the love of Christ is the cross. Not a love sinful men create that compromises or undermines the glory of God, but a love that upholds and magnifies and loves the glory of God. So when the Son of Man is glorified at the cross, it says in verse 31 that God the Father is now glorified in him. The glory of the Son, as he stoops to save us, is the glory of the Father whose will he is accomplishing, right? The ultimate expression of the love of Christ is at the cross. The ultimate source of that love, I want you to see from verse 32, is both the Father and the Son. Both the Father and the Son. Verse 32 says, If God is glorified in him, and God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Now, in the love of Christ, displayed at the cross, God the Father and God the Son share one purpose together in saving sinners. In other words, the, the glory of the Father is bound up with the glory of the Son. As the Father is glorified in the redeeming work of the Son, the Son will be glorified in the eternal love and blessedness of the Father. So in verse 32, that happens now immediately, he says, when God begins that exaltation, it happens immediately. In other words, after the cross, what follows? Resurrection. It happens immediately when God raises his, him from the dead, right? He ascends into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He has now the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. All of that happens immediately upon the Lord's obedience at the cross. It becomes very clear. We consider these things. Very clear from a simple understanding of the Bible that the ultimate aim of the love of Christ expressed most supremely at the cross is not ultimately the redemption of man. It is ultimately the glory of God. Now think with me for a moment. Right? There's, there's a, a, as we work through texts in the Bible, and as you think through, as you study your Bible, as you study your Bible, you want to come to understanding. You want to come to understanding. It's important that you understand the text. You understand what God is saying in his word to you. Once you have understanding and your mind is clear on that truth, then your heart needs to be moved by it. It needs to make the distance, the travel, the journey from the, the, the head to the heart. And understand then how that applies to us. First, see with understanding what the text is saying. 
the aim of the love of Christ, that love being most beautifully, most incomparably expressed, most supremely expressed at the cross, is not ultimately the redemption of man. It is ultimately the glory of God. It's not only or merely the redemption of man. In other words, it is ultimately the glory of God. Now, how does that then transform your understanding, your thinking, your definition, your view, your perspective on the love of God in Christ? And how a Christian understanding and viewing that love should then live, respond to God, view God, understand God. The Lord displayed infinite and matchless, incomparable, indescribable love for his own at the cross, for his own people to redeem them. It is an ultimate act of love. And although a primary expression of that love, a primary expression of it is the salvation of his own bride, we must acknowledge its ultimate and preeminent aim is the glory of God. The Son's love for the Father, and the Father's love for the Son. Listen to this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible reads, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see what his intention is there? The Lord Jesus Christ and his incomparable love displayed in his perfect obedience at the cross is to be our pattern. So one of the ways by which we define love, how the Lord Jesus Christ defined his love toward God the Father, how that is defined in bringing glory to God, we're to define it in the same way. We're to live that out for the glory of God. I thought about Psalm 19 before, right? Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. If you look at God's creation, right? Our universe, the planets in their order, the, the galaxies, the billions upon billions of galaxies, each one billions upon billions of stars, the immeasurable, inconceivable space that exists in our known universe, the marvel of creation when you look at the sun and the moon and the stars. What astounding beauty, what astounding power that God sustains and holds all of that together. Not a straight molecule out of order. But when you consider how that glorifies God, right? How that brings glory to God. It never brings more glory to God than a transformed sinner with a new heart loving and serving the Lord and following Him in obedience to His word from the heart. It will never eclipse that. We are to love and glorify God in the same way that the Lord Jesus Christ has loved and glorified God, obeying Him, trusting Him, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Incomparable love. And we're to love as He loved. But our love is to be for the glory of God. Not undermining the character of God. Not undermining the perfections of God. Not undermining His justice. Not undermining His righteousness. Not undermining His holiness. Not undermining His judgment. Not undermining God. Not undermining His character. But glorifying God. Upholding His character. And that knowledge of God comes from one place, the Word of God. If you're not in the Word of God, you can't know God. God has revealed Himself in His Word. Next, we see the love of Christ expressed at the cross. 
But next, we see the love of Christ expressed through the commandment. Back in John chapter 13, look with me at verse 33. The love of Christ expressed through the commandment. Verse 33 says this, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have a love for one another. Now the Lord begins, verse 33, with a term of endearment. In more the sense of dear children than little children. But the teaching here that he's giving is difficult. He's going away. He's going away, and where he's going, they can't come. And so he begins, verse 33, with a tender sense of care. It's affectionate here. Right? He calls them dear children. Now he's departing, and they are staying behind. He'll be with them just a little while longer. And he says to them, verse 33, you'll seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come, so now I say to you. Now think about what he said to the Jews. We've studied that passage together. What was a warning to the Jews is a mere temporary de delay here for the disciples. Remember in chapter 8, verse 21, what did the Lord say to the Pharisees there? He said, then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me, and listen, and will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. Now in, Roman, in uh, John chapter 8, there's some words conspicuously missing in the statement that he makes to his disciples in John chapter 13, right? He tells them they'll die in their sins. Here, he says, where I'm going, you can't come. Now, these are parting words, departing words. Through his death, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to leave them. And this separation is necessary, but it's temporary. Now, the disciples don't quite understand this. And I want you to see that. Flip the page to John chapter 16. They're confused here by his statement. In John chapter 16, look down at beginning at verse 16. John chapter 16, verse 16. Let's unpack their confusion just a little bit. Look at verse 16. The Lord says, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Well, that's hopeful. Look at verse 17. Then some of his disciples said amongst themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, verse 18, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's saying. Now, Jesus, in verse 19, knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Verse 20, most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. These are his disciples, but the world will rejoice. Now, on this side of the cross, we understand exactly what he's saying, right? But he's preparing them. You're going to weep and lament. The world is going to rejoice. They understand that distinction between them and the world. They understood what that meant. And he said, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Moms can say, amen, right? Amen, you keep having babies. So that's <laughs> verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow. Verse 22, right? But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Now, the, the circumstances of the disciples, slightly different at this point in time than our circumstances, but we live with the very same hope, do we not? I want to see Christ. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Christ. We want to see him. We sometimes have sorrow, don't we? But our joy is coming. We, in the future, we will have joy. I read a story this week. I read a story about Willie Mays. Remember Willie Mays, the, the Hall of Fame uh, baseball player? 
And uh, Willie Mays, on the eve of his greatest single-game performance in his baseball career, uh, apparently had some barbecue uh, that didn't agree with him. And so Willie Mays uh, didn't sleep, was up all night, just sick, terribly sick. They had to call in a doctor, uh, give Willie Mays some medicine to help him sleep. He only got a couple of hours sleep, miserable, throwing up, having a, a tough time. There was misery and sorrow, misery and sorrow. Willie Mays woke up the next morning feeling terrible, went to the game. It was against San Francisco. Out of five at-bats, Willie Mays hit four home runs, drove in eight runs. Sorrow in the morning, right, and joy and glory in the afternoon. Our home run has already been hit. The ball has already been launched off the bat. It is over the fence, and we're just waiting to come home, right? Sorrow in the morning, joy in the afternoon. The disciples here are waiting for their turn, and we're waiting for ours. We're waiting for our turn. The Lord gives us parting instruction. In the same way that he's giving them parting instruction here in John 13, he's giving us parting instruction, right? What does this look like for us? And the Lord gives that in great love. Look at verse 34. Great love. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not only is there to be great love for the glory of God, and all Christians, all genuine Christians are marked by great love, great zeal for the glory of God. But not only is there to be great love for the glory of God, we are to demonstrate great love, the love of Christ, for one another, for one another. I want you to see, beginning in verse 34, there's a commandment given here. It's a new commandment, he says in verse 34. And the first thing that he does is he defines that commandment. He defines the commandment. He begins 30, in verse 34 by referring to it as a new commandment. Now, what does he mean by new? If you go back in your Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, the Bible says that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? The Bible says the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The next is like unto it. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Here, it's rendered new by the statement that he makes in verse 34, as I have loved you. That renders it new. Right? It's rendered new by the fact that now this commandment to love is rooted and grounded in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Love one another. That's not new. How are we to love one another? Jesus answered, as I have loved you. That's what's new. You see? He says, I was just humbled myself. I just humbled myself to wash your feet. I will die on the cross for you. I have given my life to redeem you to myself. Love like that. With that as its preeminent example, that's new at this point. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's spoken in light of an understanding of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not often the case that a Christian is called to die for their brother, die for their sister. But genuine, Christ-like love should be a series of little deaths, shouldn't it? You may be called to pay that ultimate price, but genuine Christ-like love is a series of deaths, deaths to self, deaths to convenience, deaths to comfort, deaths to pride, Deaths to your schedule, deaths to your preferences, calls for deaths, deaths to self. That's the Christian love that Christ has shown his disciples in washing their feet and in dying for them at the cross in innumerable other ways. But how do we do that? How do we do that? I want you to look with me at 1 John chapter 5. This bears repeating. 1 John chapter 5. We looked at this text not long ago.
how do we know we are loving our brothers in the way that Christ has loved us? Look at 1 John chapter 5, and look at verse 2. By this, he says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Just keeps coming around, doesn't it? I remember talking to someone one time that had been listening for a while. They made the comment to me that in the preaching of God's word, there's this constant emphasis on obeying God. And he was saying that in a derogatory way. That's all, all you do. You just preach obedience. Obe obey, 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 obey. And that's what he was hearing, right? You just preach obedience all the time. Obey God, obey God. It's because it keeps coming up. Paul says to Titus, right? Remind them, that, remind them of these things constantly. They should be performing good works, faithful in good works. We love God when we keep his commandments. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God. Here it is again. I can't get away from it in verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So when the Bible says for you to stir one another up to love and good works, what should you do? You should love God and love your brother by keeping that commandment. You're to consider one another. You're to stir one another up to love and good works. When the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, what do you do? Well, you assemble with your brothers. You love God and you love your brother and obey that commandment. When the Bible says to exhort your brothers daily while it's, while it's called today, what do you do? You exhort your brothers daily and you love God, love your brother by obeying that commandment. When the Bible commands you to warn those who are unruly, to comfort the faint-hearted, to uphold the weak, to be patient with all, to see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, to pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all, what do you do? You obey that text. And when you obey that text, it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it's by this that we know that we love the children of God. I don't know about you, but when I was first reading the Bible and first going through 1 John, I remember thinking to myself, man, I, I think I, I love the brothers. I mean, I love being around the brothers. I want, I want, to, I want to go to group. You know, I want to see them. It's like Sunday to Sunday is too much time. I need something in the middle. Oh, we've got Tuesday night group. You know, I wanted to be around the brothers. But I remember thinking to myself, do I, do I really love the brothers? It seems subjective to me and to you. Maybe at one point or another, it, it seems subjective. There is a subjective element to it. Do you love the brothers from the heart? But in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, you have an objective element by which to examine yourself. By this, we know that we love God, love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's the second half of verse 2 there that takes obedience out of the realm of some heartless, mindless, ritualistic legalism, right? Because to the heartless, ritualistic legalist, his commandments are burdensome, and they'll see to it that it's burdensome for everybody else too. But in the second half of verse 3, his commandments are not burdensome. To the Christian, to the one who's been transformed, the one who's been born again, has a new heart and dwelt by God's Spirit, his commandments are a delight. They are the Christian's joy. And in that, we know that we love the children of God. We assure our hearts before him. So first, he defines the commandment. You are to love one another. How are we to love one another? As I have loved you. As I have loved you. You also ought to love one another. But secondly now, in verse 35, he then, with this commandment, in love, he sanctifies or sets apart his disciples. Look at verse 35. He says there, back in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this, by what? By the love that we show one another. By the way in which you love one another. By this love, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, first thing I want you to see from verse 35, in setting them apart, right, he bounds them. He puts a, a boundary, if you will, around the people of God, disciples of God, around the believer. We have our center. Our center is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? 
in his revealed word, what has been given to us, the faith that we've been delivered to, that is our center, Christ and him crucified. Our boundary, so to speak, from verse 35, then becomes our love for one another. What marks off the believer? What separates the believer from everyone else in verse 35? Love for one another. Now this love specifically is for one another, but that doesn't exclude everyone else. We're even, Matthew 5, to love our enemies, aren't we? But it's by this love, specifically for one another, that all others will know that we are his disciples. He bounds them, if you will. He puts a boundary around them. And that boundary is love. This love forms the community, forms the church. Let's look at this. I want you to, if you got your hand still, your finger in 1 John chapter 5, flip back a page to 1 John chapter 3. This is given to us pretty clearly here in 1 John chapter 3, and I want you to see this. Our center is Christ, but one of the ways in which the Lord marks off the people of God is by the love that we're to have for one another, the same love that Christ has for us. Look at 1 John chapter 3, drop down to verse 10. Verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. In this, they're marked off from one another, right? There's a dividing line. What's that dividing line? What marks them off? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. There's one, holiness, right? Set apart to God in holiness, obedience to his commands from the heart. But the other mark is at the end of verse 10, nor is he who does not love his brother. Do you see? Verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, Cain's works were evil, and his brother's works were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. You think to yourself, do I, do I really love the brethren? Do I love them? 1 John 5, 2. By this we know we love the children of God. We love God and we keep his commandments, right? Verse 13, or verse 14. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. There is no in-between. Right? There's no fuzzy gray area, nebulous area in the middle. You don't love your brother. You hate your brother. You hate your brother. You're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this, we know love. How are we to love one another? We have the example of the Lord Jesus Christ as he has loved us. By this, we know love, verse 16, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It gives you some pretty practical instruction there, doesn't it? We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whoever has this world's goods, sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in that one? In other words, it's a rhetorical question. It does not. Verse 18, my little children, there it is again, right? Dear ones, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, do something. Obey these commandments. Obey the Lord in this, 19. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall our, assure our hearts before him. That's interesting there. Verse 19, you know, you don't earn your salvation. And you don't earn, in that sense, your sanctification. But God is sovereign over your sanctification and has ordained that he would use means by which he accomplishes that. One of the means by which God effects your sanctification in your Christian life is your obedience to him in these commandments. And in verse 19, look, by this, we know that we are of the truth. By what? The fact that we're not loving merely in word or in tongue, but indeed in the truth. 
in deed and truth. You want to assure your heart before God? You want to assure yourself before Him that you are of the truth, that you are in Him? Then go out and obey the Lord and love your brother. You see? Go out and obey Him. Love your brothers. Verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. In other words, go out and do those things so that you may have a clear, uncondemning conscience before God, and in that you will assure your heart before Him. Verse 22, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. This love, this commandment, this new commandment, based, grounded, rooted in, founded on the example of the Lord Jesus Christ is that which bounds us. It's that which marks us off from the world. It's that which distinguishes the people of God, but it's that which distinguishes the Christian. It distinguishes the Christian. Secondly, this mark not only bounds them, it distinguishes them, distinguishes them from everyone else. And I want you to notice in verse 35, that distinguishing mark has an evangelistic or a missional implication. It's by this all will know. You have love for one another, and by this love for one another, all others will know. And in that, we see the testimony of the glory of God in Jesus Christ in the gospel. We see a testimony of a transformed heart, a transformed people in this dark world. We are the light of the world then in Christ's stead as a testimony of his grace to us. It marks us off from the world so that all will know. Lastly, you see the love of God, right, in the, at the cross, the love of Christ expressed at the cross. You see the love of Christ then expressed for his people, for his church and for the world. You see that expressed in the commandment. Lastly, we see the love of Christ expressed in his covenant. Look at verses 36 through 38 back in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 36. The love of Christ expressed in covenant. Verse 36 says this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now but you shall follow me afterward. So Peter said to him in verse 37, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him in verse 38, will you lay your, down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now Peter picks up on the angst that was generated from verse 33, where the Lord said, little children, I shall be with you only a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, Peter picks up on that. Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't follow. Certainly he and the other disciples can't be equated with the Jews, but Peter sees it, and he asks the question, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. It's interesting from verse 36. The Lord clarifies this for Peter here in verse 36, that where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. That little word now limits the inability of Peter to follow him to the present. But then what does he do? Immediately he says, but you shall follow me after Afterwards, you shall follow me. Now, in this, we see Peter's weakness, Peter's pride, even more evident here, and probably even more evident in Matthew's account. Turn to Matthew chapter 26, and let's look at the same circumstance from Matthew's perspective. In Matthew chapter 26, it just gives us a view here and setting this up of Peter's weakness, his ignorance, his pride, but his 
frailty. Matthew chapter 26, and look down beginning at verse 31. And Jesus said to them in verse 31, All of you will be made to stumble uh, because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. They've got a shadowy understanding of what's going on here. We've already seen that in John chapter 16. Peter answers him in verse 33 and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him in verse 34, Assuredly, that's a solemn word being given here to Peter. Truly, truly, Peter, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now the rooster crowed usually... They say in the third watch of the night, so middle of the night, between midnight and 3 a.m., around 3 a.m., the rooster would crow. So a short time from now, Peter, a short time from now, before the rooster crows, before that, even that third watch of the night, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said to him, verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said, following Peter's lead here, all the disciples. Back in John chapter 13, there's confusion, there's ignorance, there's arrogance, there's pride. Peter has put his foot in his mouth before. This is another example. But Jesus responds here with a very hard saying, verse 38. Jesus answered him, will you, Peter, lay down your life for my sake? Now again, that is laden with innuendo concerning the cross. Most assuredly, Jesus says at the end of verse 38, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Before the night is out, Peter denies Christ. And you think about the motivation for Peter's denial, maybe some cause for Peter's denial. Peter, obviously, there is weakness here, there's pride here, there's arrogance here. But Peter is going to deny Christ. And when Peter denies Christ, it's not only for a lack of courage. It's certainly for a lack of courage. Peter has his own self-preservation in mind as a part of that denial. But a principal reason, and we'll get there in the text, a principal reason that Peter denies Christ is because of the shame of being considered a disciple of the Lord, of a Lord who is in fetters and on his way to a cross. And we look at the example of Peter, and we have to remind ourselves that to stand for Christ means to stand for Christ even when everything appears to be lost. To stand for Christ even when you're standing alone. To stand for Christ when others have forsaken him and you. To stand for Christ, to be willing to stand, and to stand when it gets tough, when everything around you appears to be lost. And Peter, at this stage, isn't willing to do that. Isn't willing to do that. And he denies the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice, you're thinking about that, right? At a time where you would have wanted Peter to stand shoulder with shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with the Lord in the courtyard as he's facing these ridiculous trials, right? To stand with him, Peter doesn't. Maybe you can remember times when you should have stood for the Lord when you didn't. I certainly can to my shame, when you should have stood for the Lord and you didn't, and you compromised, and you compromised because of cowardice, or you compromised because of shame, whatever your motivation for compromise, you compromised, and you compromised the way that Peter did. But I want you to notice something wonderful back in John chapter 13.
Peter is one of his own. And having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them, ace telos, to the end. He loved them to the limit, to the max. So despite the frailty, despite the weakness, despite the ignorance or the arrogance of man, we see in verses 37 and 38, the you will deny me in verse 38 does not undo you will follow me afterward in verse 36. Do you see that? I mean, laden in there is this beautiful picture of the covenant love and faithfulness of God to love his own who are in the world, to love them to the end. Right back, we're at John chapter 13, verse 1, right with that statement. Nothing can separate us from the covenant love of God in Christ. If you're in Christ, we'll soon see Peter restored. And Jesus told Peter in Luke chapter 22, listen to this from Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 31. The Lord said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But what has the Lord done? Verse 32, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. When you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. This is a glorious truth that we can see here between the lines, if you will. John chapter 13, verses 36 to 38. The covenant love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And we're going to see that true of Peter, exemplified in Peter's restoration as we get to that text. It's a glorious picture of the love of Christ, amen? The love of Christ at the cross, indescribably, matchlessly, ineffably displayed at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ in the commandment to us to love one another and through the commandment for us to love one another to the world. And then lastly, in the covenant love of the Lord Jesus Christ to pray for and to secure us even in our weakest moments, even in our most shameful denials. All that, the blessed love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his own. Are you in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you've never turned from your sin to follow him, then you are destined for judgment. The sentence has been already, it's been rendered. The verdict is in. John chapter 3, you are condemned already because you have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. Turn from your sin. Put your faith and trust in Christ and be a recipient of this love. Love Him in this way. Let me leave you with this. From Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. I just want you to listen. This is Paul to the church at Ephesus. And he writes, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and worship you and thank you that having loved us who are in the world, you loved us to the end. 
We praise you, Lord, for your incomparable, indescribable, and infinite, and matchless, and unchanging love to us. We praise you, Lord, for how that is beautifully, gloriously displayed at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how that, that love displayed at the cross instructs us and informs us how we are to love, and who we are to love. We praise you, Lord, that you have bound us, marked us, set us apart, sanctified us by your love, and that we are to love one another with the love with which you loved us. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. You are worthy of our trust. And that you have said nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. We thank you for your covenant faithfulness to your people. We thank you for the future hope that we have. The promise of an inheritance with Christ. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for these glorious blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you preserve us by your Spirit, that you empower us by your Spirit to love you and to keep your commandments and to love one another as we should. We acknowledge, Lord, that we don't do that perfectly far, far from it. We need you, Lord, and we depend upon you. We thank you, God, for the strength that your Spirit supplies to help us in that and to spur us on. I pray, God, that we would be convicted by the shameful denials that we far too frequently fall under. I pray, God, that you would strengthen us against that. You would strengthen us to boldly, and confidently, and self-denyingly live for the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Ultimately, God, for the aim that is your eternal glory, which we long to see, which we long to uphold. Help us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for this text of Scripture. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen.